So this is from the Greek, Greek period. Archimedes, most of you are familiar with, but you may not exactly know what he did in mathematics. You might have heard of Archimedes principle in uh, fluid mechanics. But he, he is considered as one of the greatest mathematicians of all time along with uh, so Archimedes, Gauss and Newton and Gauss were generally considered as the three greatest mathematicians in the Western world, at least up to the classical times. So uh, for our purposes, he more or less invented what he now call as integral calculus. He basically calculated surface areas and volumes of several smooth surfaces, right? By uh, what is now called uh, Archimedes' method of exhaustion, which, in in some primitive sense, is integral calculus. Yes, so uh, it's better. On in number theory, he was supposed to have measured the circumference of the Earth in around 200 BC using whatever uh, mathematics he had. So, I mean, many of you would have seen what uh, stereographic projection is, right? Stereographic projection of the sphere onto the plane. So. Ptolemy already had given the stereographic projection uh, some 2000 years back. Of course, most of you must be familiar with Euclid, Euclidean geometry, the five books of Euclid, and so on. So, uh, in, in our context, he already had recognized that the geodesics on the sphere are great circles. So geodesics are roughly speaking paths of shortest distance. In a plane, shortest path from uh, between two points is a straight line. Right? So geodesics are in some sense of that kind, or not quite exactly, but uh, uh, so on, on the surface of the sphere, if you want to uh, go from one point to the other by a shortest distance, the path you have to take is along a great circular arc. Uh, a, a great circle on a sphere is this, a circle formed by section of the sphere by a, a plane through the center of the sphere. Right? The equator, for example, is a great circle or the polar circle is another great circle. So, so the if you take any two points on the on a on a on the surface of a, of a sphere, the there is a unique great circle through the two points and The shortest path between the two points on the surface of the sphere is along this great circular arc. Of course, there will be a small arc and there will be the major arc. So the smaller one is the gives you the shortest path. So Euclid also already had uh, recognized that. So all these, of course, come before the days of calculus. Calculus was invented in the West in the 16th century, 1500 something. Basically, differential calculus. Okay. Although differential calculus 
in, in uh, some uh, form was already invented several centuries earlier in Kerala. Especially uh, in North Kerala apparently. I am not an authority on these things, but anyway, so uh, the Kerala School of Mathematics, Nilakanta, Madhava and so on, had some form of uh, differential calculus uh, some three centuries or so before the time of uh, Leibniz and Newton in the West. Leibniz in Germany and Newton in England. So once they had calculus, of course, differential calculus is a natural tool to study geometry. So post-calculus period, you have uh, On Descartes and Kiroma, both from France, they developed what now we call as coordinate geometry, or analytical geometry. Because there were so many Bernoullis who were mathematicians several generations of them. So the Bernoullis here are Johann Bernoulli and Apo Bernoulli who are, who are brothers. Johann Bernoulli and Apo Bernoulli. And then we have L'Hopital, you might have heard of him, the, what you call as the L'Hopital's rule for differentiation. He was supposed to have written the first book on differential calculus. He also studied curves and surfaces and introduced the term curvature. You might have heard of him uh, in, if you have studied some PDE, you might have seen what is called Clairaut's equation, partial differential equation. Oh, I'm sorry. So, of course, okay, doesn't matter. So, you have a great Euler. Clairo was the first who studied space curves. So people had been studying planar. Clairo studied space curves and surfaces and so on. So Euler, as I already mentioned, as a curve of shutter spot on surfaces, something. So now what are called the geodesic equations were introduced by Euler, the part set of differential equations. Mon, Monge, uh, Dupin, and so on. Monge actually had uh, made a lot of contributions to surface state, different geometry and partial differential equations. So we have so what, what are called Monge Ampere equations. And then comes the, the real beginning of differential geometry, curves. Curves in a plane. So 
stream on mm. garbu b had a whole school of Italian geometers. Garbo was a French geometer. Lee, of course, was Norwegian. So, Christopher, you have what are called Christopher symbols, which uh, give you the, the fundamental, fundamental forms of on the surface, the coefficients. Bianchi, Beltrami, Levicivita. Levicivita is one person. Okay? So Levicivita and Vici, these are all Italian geometers. You have what are called uh, Bianchi identities. Uh, Laplace Beltrami equation, Laplace Beltrami operator, Levicivita connection on, on a Riemannian oh. manifold. Vici Kavaja had uh, become rather important in recent years uh, because uh, what, what, was co what is called Vichy flow was used to do his analysis, okay, to prove a, a resultant topology called the Poincaré conjecture, namely it was Poincaré himself. And Elie Cartan. Um, I'm mentioning Elie Cartan because there is another well known Cartan, son of Elie Cartan, known as Ari Cartan. So, up to essentially the beginning of 19th century, and uh, I mean the end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, these are more or less the all the important names. In, in development of geometry. Poincaré was one of most profound and uh, there is essentially no branch of mathematics which he did not, to which he did not make very important contributions. One of the last, what we can call is universalist in mathematics. His contributions were so covered, so wide a uh, spectrum of areas. So you can probably say that modern differential geometry basically started with Elie Cartan. So now let me get back to Gauss and Riemann for a brief time. So the first one is discussion a general circa superficies curvas. So this is uh, in Latin. So, uh, and during time of Gauss and so on earlier in the, in the Western world, Latin was the language of science. Everybody wrote in Latin any scientific investigation. So
So this is what that, that means. So it goes, there are two well-known discussion. Eh? One is on geometry, the other is on number theory. The other one is called discussion eh? the arithmetic. So both played very, very important roles in the development of mathematics. Okay, so, and then the, I'll come to Riemann. The, the next one is due to Riemann. But let me say a few things about the stories, if you like. Gauss was uh, the director of the Astronomical Observatory in Hannover, Germany. Hannover is a, is a town in Germany. Uh, at that time, it, it was uh, uh, what is I don't know what was it called? Mm, some district kind of thing, whatever it was called. So he was uh, in the astronomical observatory, but the, the government asked him to undertake a land survey of the district, let's say. So Gauss was uh, doing that, an extensive survey of the land in that district. Which, which is again essentially a piece of uh, surface on the on uh, earth right so that was what induced him to study geometry of the surface of earth and in general geometry of surfaces in general okay so so he undertook a study of uh, uh, surfaces in general and came out with the, the definitive work there in which he proved the most basic fundamental results about geometry of surfaces. Surfaces in R3, okay, two dimensional surfaces. So, see, in geometry, one of the most important concepts, geometrical concept, is the concept of curvature. So, you know, what is now usually called as the Gaussian curvature now. There are two most fundamental results due to Gauss which appeared in this uh, discussion. Eh? One is called land uh, survey. So, uh, okay, that is not the same. Gauss himself called it as uh, theorem Egergiam. So this means a wonderful theorem. So it, it is a wonderful theorem, although Gauss himself called it that way. But see, this is a very astonishing theorem. Uh, it basically says, uh, we'll say more about it in the course of the, uh, course of whatever it is, course of the workshop. Uh, basically, it says that curvature of a surface is intrinsic. Uh, we will explain more about this later on. The curvature actually is defined when you look at the definition of curvature, it is not intrinsic. Right? It is calculated. Uh, using formulae which are not intrinsic. 
intrinsic roughly speaking mean the following so you have space and your cell size is somewhere sitting in the space right so you have an ambient space so the definition of the term curvature actually involves the ambient space And the formula you get also formula developed by Gauss himself also involves the ambient space R3, the space in which this cell size is sitting. But the theorem says the curvature of the surface actually does not depend on the ambient space. All right? Whether it's uh, how it sits in the space. Okay, so um, uh, we'll try to say more about this when we come to that. The other is called the Gauss Bonnet theorem. Oh, Bonnet is a name that I have missed there. Bonnet was a French mathematician. So, Gauss Bonnet theorem another profound theorem which actually has uh, resulted in uh, development of much of modern different geometry basically the importance uh, of the theorem basically comes from the fact that it connects apparently different kind, different, uh, let's say, quantities. There is a purely topological invariant coming to the picture. There is a purely geometric concept. And there is an analytic concept. The curvature is purely a geometric concept. So what it says roughly is that if you take a surface, let's take a, say a compact surface for example, and take the average of the curvature over the surface, which essentially means that you integrate the curvature function over the surface. So uh, the left hand side looks basically like this, whatever it means. So K is a curvature. This is some area measure. Don't worry about it right now. And uh, so what you have on the left hand side is a geometric quantity average over the surface through integration. So through, through an analytic process. What you have on the right hand side is a purely topological number, uh, number which is uh, purely a topological invariant, what is called the Euler characteristic. So hopefully, at the very end of the course, we'll say something about this theorem, if, if we had, if we have time at that time. Euler characteristic can be also given, a, can be expressed in combinatorial terms. Okay, just I'll say a word, a sentence about it. For, for example, if you take a sphere, divide that into small triangle-like things. Not usual triangle, but triangles lying on the or more precisely, if you want, you can let me draw it, the things, two things separately, so that
are you familiar with the second picture there it's formed by four triangles a triangle like this on each side of the triangle you have another triangle all meeting at a point this is what is called a tetrahedron okay so you can if you like inscribe the tetrahedron inside the sphere so and then flatten out the curved parts there so topologically you can identify the sphere with the surface of the tetrahedron so this is what is called a triangulation of the sphere so the fact is that you can triangulate any compact surface so which essentially means you can topologically you can build the surface using triangular faces and then what you do is so once you have you look at the tetrahedron there are three kinds of objects there vertices and the edges and the faces right of course so there is no unique way to triangulate you can further divide this into smaller triangles for example okay so the num these numbers are not the same they don't remain constant however euler said the number of edges minus the number of faces plus the number of vertices is always a constant e minus v plus f is a constant so this number is called the euler characteristic and that is what you have on the right hand side of the the ghost bonnet this is a topological meaning i although i have uh, dis uh, described it in terms of uh, this triangulation what is it edges and so on this is topological invariant two surfaces are homeomorphic they have the same euler characteristic you can express this in terms of uh, homology what is called the algebraic topological concepts in terms of what are called the homology groups of the surface the number of elements in, in the different homology groups so anyway so it, it is a purely topological invariant so so that's one of the reasons why ghost bonnet is so important it connects purely geometric quantity with a purely topological quantity so in general this is true in mathematics anything which connects two apparently disparate objects is going to be important okay so i am not going to say anything about the uh, uh, development of uh, geometry in the 20th century and so on so modern different geometry uh, i will probably say something my next uh, part of the talk the, the thing i mentioned a little while ago about ricci ricci curvature and the poincare conjecture this is quite recent on a uh, not very long ago so there again this uh, problem is a topological one but the solution came from analysis and geometry through a study of ricci curvature flow of ricci curvature flow just means uh, you will also see something about the flow of flows on surfaces and of course so certain sets of differential equations that's it for the historical blah blah so let me now say something about the setting of the subject what are the geometric objects that you are going to study what are the kinds of uh, geometric concepts that you are going to look at so what is the setting of doing all this the subject is geometry but there is a there is an adjective right namely differential so the two things therefore you are going to study geometry using differential calculus basically okay so there is also what is called algebraic geometry which studies geometry using algebraic tools 
polynomial, rational function, rings, right? For us, therefore, we are going to study geometry using calculus, basically, differential calculus. So, our objects are all going to be smooth objects. Smooth means smooth, okay? So, involves differentiation. Function is not differentiable at a point, there is there is something happened there, right? You have a corner kind of thing. So it's no longer smooth at that point. If you have a look at this curve, this is not differentiable at that point where it turns like that. There's a corner. So so this is not smooth. Uh, that is smooth. Of course, we are going to study geometry in a very special setting, simple setting, but in general, what is the setting for doing differential geometry? That's what I will try to say something before we come to a simple situation where we are going to study everything. So basically, therefore, we have to have differentiation, whatever object that you are going to study. You are going to study some space, let us say. On that space, you are, you are to be able to talk of differentiation, right? Differentiability of functions. So, differentiability of functions, we know where? Only in Euclidean spaces, R, Rn. So, obviously, we have to build new things only from things that we already know, we already have, right? So we have differentiation on Euclidean spaces in our kitty, let's say. We may have our tools available. So using that, we have to build whatever you want to build now. Also remember that differentiation is A local process, right? The differentiability of a function at a point depends only on the behavior of the function in a neighborhood of that point, right? If you are interested in this point, how the function behaves here is immaterial, right? It's not going to play any part in checking whether the function is differentiable at that point. So what happens near that point? How the function behaves near that point? That's only going to matter. So we express this by saying that differentiation is a local property, right? So, so geometry so differential geometry using calculus basically. differentiation. So, what is uh, an obvious thing to try? What are two, two things that you have in mind? One is, we know, assume at least, we know what is meant by differentiation in Euclidean spaces, right? And differentiation is a local property. So, it's natural to look at spaces, whatever they mean, which, so you want to look at spaces on which differentiation will make sense, right? 
and then we can try to do some geometry there. So, so what are the requirements there? You have a space on which you want to do differentiation. To do the differentiation, what do you need? We have to build from what we have already. What we have already is differentiation in Euclidean spaces. So, you have to bring in Euclidean spaces somewhere to be able to use that. Locally, you do not have to have Euclidean spaces because you want only work locally. Differentiation is local. So, if you have spaces which locally are Euclidean spaces, look like Euclidean spaces, we can try to define differentiation, right? So, what are we looking at, trying to look at? Okay, so differentiation, Euclidean spaces. In Rn, let's say, in So we are we look for spaces which look like whatever that look like mean. We will come to that. Okay. So we want to try to build up spaces from pieces of Euclidean spaces. And the first step, therefore, what do you consider? You must make this more precise take a sphere or whatever surface you need, like cylinder or anything, do not look at the sphere as a whole, but look at the patch, small piece of that. Take a point on the sphere and look at a small part of the sphere around that point. How does that look like, that small piece, sphere, you have the point here, so this I am taking as yes, like this. So, if your piece is small enough, it looks more like flat, okay? But flat or curved does not matter, but it basically is, is a disk, right? Small disk, maybe a little curved, it does not matter, still a disk. If you want, you can flatten it to get a flat disk. Anyway, topologically it is the same, right? You can just squash it. So, a sphere, for example, looks like a disk locally at each point, right? Or even be more basically the real line or, or a curve, right? Take a curve, take a point on the curve take a small piece of that curve, that looks like an interval basically, right? Maybe it turned like this, but still an interval. We look for spaces on which such a thing is possible, right? Spaces on which around each point there is a neighborhood which looks like a piece of Rn, a ball in Rn or whatever, some disk in R2, okay? So, look at a space such that, so for every point P in that space, there is a neighborhood of that point which looks like Rn or a ball in Rn or something. But what is meant by this looks like? You have to make that precise. Okay? So, topologically is homeomorphic 2. Right? We said, so this is, this is an interval, not really, but you know, state and it is an interval. Similarly, here, this not exactly a disk, but only when you flatten it, you get a disk. Flattening is the only model. So, mathematically, what you are looking for is how to make this 
term looks like press lines. There's some topology there. So, for each point, there is a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to the ball in Rn, to a ball in Rn, or even to a whole of Rn, doesn't matter. Open balls, any open ball in Rn is homeomorphic to Rn, you know. So, whether you say it's a ball or the whole of Rn, doesn't matter topologically. Okay, fine, you look at a space like this. Then what do you do? We, what was our object? To try to define differentiation. So, in other words, uh, if you take a piece like this and look at a function from that piece to R, let us say, for example. You have a small piece of the sphere here and you are looking at a function from that small piece to R. So, when should we say that this function is differentiable? This is a disk, right? It's homeomorphic a disk, that's what we have assumed. So, we know what is meant by saying that a map from a disk to R is differentiable, right? A disk in R2. So, from R2 to R, we know what is maybe differentiability. So, you have to use that. So, you already have a homeomorphism here, okay? So, what was our assumption? Every point has a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to a disk, let us say, or a ball in R. So, call that as H if you want, or maybe uh, following usual uh, convention for these charts, you use phi, psi, and so on. Doesn't matter anyway. So, suppose phi is this homeomorphism. So, you want to define differentiability of this function using what we know already for the differentiability of this function via this homeomorphism. So, if you end up with a function from here to here, you know what differentiability means. So, how do you, so starting from here, what do you do? You go to the disk using the homeomorphism and then go to R. So, in other words, this is phi inverse in this direction, let us say. So, it compose phi inverse and So, if you compose uh, what this f and this homeomorphism that you have, you are going to have a function from the disk to r. So, typically you would like to define that this function f is differentiable if that composition is differentiable. That means the, the identification that you make between the small piece there and a disk. Once you identify, then the function is differentiable as a function on the disk. That's what it is. So, this is what we do, but there is a problem. We resume after the break. Uh, you think of what the problem is there. Okay? See, whenever you try to define something, that is something many times you say this is well defined. <laughs> okay? So, what is meant by this well defined? Why you have to, what, what is that you have to see here? Just think about it, we'll resume it. Uh, resume after the.